morning and welcome to the Veterans Forum. This program is coming to you from the TV studios of Derry, New Hampshire. My name is Bob Stevens. I have the pleasure of introducing and hosting the program. We've been doing it for quite a while. For those of you who do not know, it's a program that we're doing in cooperation with the Library of Congress. They have something called the Veterans History Project that was started in 2000, wherein they're asking stations such as this and guys like me, I guess, if they can and will offer a chance for each and any veteran, male or female, who served in any of the wars from World War II, Vietnam, Korea, Desert Storm, and whatever they're having today, if they can and will share those in experiences in a televised recorded interview. What we're doing, in effect, is having the people who made history report it as they made it so that there's no way of had anybody shading, forgetting, or altering the facts. Very simply, if you feel that you would like to, we ask you to come and join us and do the show. The address and how to contact me, if you will, will be at the base. Very simply, the story is this. If you don't tell your story, nobody else will, and we've lost all that history. Frankly and candidly, without hanging crepe, we're fighting the clock and the calendar because every one of us is getting older day by day and uh, we're just not around to do any more of the talking. As an example, how we are time compressed, I was told when we first started the program in 2000 that they estimated at one time during World War II, there were some 16 million guys and gals working all around the world doing their particular things. Some were great, some were not, others were mundane, but everybody had a job to do and we did it. And that's what they're trying to do, is build a continuum. I had an input, oh, maybe, what, two, three years ago now, updating those statistics. And uh, that 16 million they estimate now is down to maybe two, two and a half million guys and gals surviving. And though on the bottom of the instruction or the information sheet, uh, they said the updated rate of death and dying was anywhere from 12 to 1,500 a day, it, which means <laughs> we're not going to be around too much longer. But so much for that. One other point I'd like to bring to your attention. Any guy or friends of any veteran who feels that he or she may need some help, we ask that there's a special line set up throughout the state. Dial 211 and you'll be put in contact with a counselor or someone who's trained to help fill in whatever you need. Don't be afraid to ask for it, guys, gals. You work for it, it's there for you to have. Today we have another one of these fellows who did some things way back when, and I'd like to ask him to introduce himself in a moment. We'll get the story going, okay? Tony, if you will, will you please tell us your name, spell your last name for the record, and tell us where you now live. Yes, my name is Edwards Fasu Leeper III, and my nickname, as you intimated, is Tony, which I've been known as most of my life. I live now in North Sandwich, New Hampshire, where I've lived for 30-some years, and my wife and I operate a bed and breakfast there, oh, and good. it keeps us busy. Good. It should be, Ron. a good country to have B&Bs, I would hope. Right. What branch of your service, and what were your service dates? Well, I was in the Navy, uh, our family is derived from Navy people. My grandfather was a lieutenant commander in the Navy, uh, went to Annapolis, class of 1881, played on the first football team wow. that played another school. And uh, so we've always been inclined to root for the Navy. He used to be taken at, for the Army-Navy football game in Philadelphia, the suburbs of which I grew up in, and he would be honored on Army-Navy Day at Municipal Stadium. Well, great. And FDR would change sides at halftime, but oh, he yeah. would stay on the Navy side. <laughs> well, he was the Secretary of the Navy at one time anyway, we know that, yeah. Now, that's where you are today. Uh, what I'd like to do, is to go back and find out how you came to be here. For example, uh, where and when were you born, and how was your life uh, growing up as a child uh, in uh, apparently the same time as us, the Depression times, and what was your life like? Well, my, wife, my life in Wayne, Pennsylvania was really uh, a joy. We lived uh, on one side of our 
house was the high school principal, and on the other side was the bus driver of the high school. Uh, well, when were you born? Bus. I was born July 1st, 1927, okay. in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, at Bryn Mawr Hospital. Came home shortly thereafter, I imagine. Uh, and, uh, they brought you back from, anyway. From early times, uh, we lived in Wayne until I went into the service. Okay, well, how was your life growing up, though? Uh, growing up, brothers and sisters, growing up in Wayne, stuff? I often think about uh, how we would get on our, we would go out in the daytime and come home at supper time. And okay, the, when the light was on the porch, you had to come home. That's right. Yep. There was uh, uh, something to do, whether it be uh, being the first one to go swimming at some uh, stream outside of town or riding our bicycles, uh, getting firecrackers. Uh, I remember on 4th of July, my father would go to a neighboring town and buy packs of firecrackers. And because I wasn't old enough to play with matches, I would have to get my mother to light the piece of punk for okay. me. And then I could unravel the, the firecrackers and set them off out in the street or wherever I happened to be. Did you ever put them under the tin cans? Well, we did that. Uh, but the one that I remember most is that uh, I don't know what I was, five, six, seven years old, but I had a little red knitted bathing suit and I was across the street and I found a knot hole in a utility pole. Uh -huh. And I started putting the firecrackers in it and it slowly got bigger and bigger and the firecrackers would go further down. And then a car came up and it was a police car. And he rolled down the window and proceeded to ball me out, and needless to say, I was frightened as could be, and uh, I hesitate to say what happened, but it was warm and very interesting, but well, I had you to can, go you back. Can let us in because that, there's nobody going to shoot you now. What, were you you're pushing them in were, and then lighting them or just jamming them in? I, I, I was just putting them in and exploding them. Oh, and they go and up? Then, and that would make the hole bigger. Each oh, time. Well, destroying and government I was, property. I yeah. was, as they say in New Hampshire, excavating. Yeah. So at any rate, um, the cop just bawled me out and yeah. left no. me there. <laughs> no. And Did you have I any went. culprits like brothers and sisters to help you out in this heinous crime? What? Did you have any brothers or sisters? No. No, I was by myself that particular time. No, but, but do you but have any? I had any? friends uh, quite nearby. Uh, two very close friends lived in the house behind us, and another friend two, three houses away, Fritzie Hallowell, who became an aeronautical engineer. But uh, they were my closest friends, and uh, we managed to get into all sorts of trouble, be thrown out of the movie house for, for a while. Okay. On. Tell us, because that's the stuff that makes life interesting. <laughs> Why were you thrown out? What were you doing? Being <laughs> raucous, noisy? Well, actually, <clears throat> I had uh, figured out how to take a cap from a cap pistol mm -hmm. and mold it around a BB, and then with tissue paper, twirl it behind so that when you threw it, it would hit something hard, the cap would go off. Oh, like a hand so grenade. Then I built a, a uh, slingshot, and with the slingshot and a supply of these homemade torpedoes, a friend of mine and I went to the movies one night. It happened to be Ronald Coleman and Myrna Loy or some love movie. But at any rate, we took one out and sprang it shot it up onto the stage of the movie theater and it exploded. Oh, and that was started a riot. That's almost started a riot. And then I put one sideways up against the wall. And then I thought that we should have alibis. So I told my friend, I said, Dickie, I'm going to go up and go to the men's room. And while I'm up there, you explode one. And then I'll come back and you can go up. And that way we'll each have an alibi that we were in the in the John. In the, in the uh, uh, outer area uh, when one went off. So I went up to do that. And as I said, it was Ronald Coleman and Myrna Loy, I think, and some love thing. And this was, we were the first youngsters that were seen there. So we were nabbed really? and 
taken off to the police station and did they rescued frisk you by or patch you down and all that? They, they confiscated all of our ammunition yeah. and so on. And a few days later, the hearing was held and we were admonished never to do anything like that again. Were you brought before a judge or something <laughs> like this? <laughs> we were only in fifth or sixth grade maybe at the time. Juvenile delinquent, huh? <laughs> yes, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty now, much. What other un-American activities did you do in school? Were you any, played any sports or anything like that? Yes, I, uh, I loved all athletics, and unfortunately I was very small, so I didn't really uh, get the school I went to. Had age group and weight adjusted, so I would be on the 90-pound team even though I was only 70 pounds in weight because of my age. Mm -hmm. So I played in that until finally I uh, couldn't do that anymore. I tried, I did try basketball because they had a swimming pool at this school and I got very interested in swimming. And uh, in, in eighth grade, I began practicing diving with the, with the team and ninth grade, then I was on the team diving for tenth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth oh. grade. Were you good? And uh, well, thanks to the war, the national competition for this was a prep school which I attended, and in those days, the prep schools and the high schools didn't mingle with each other. Oh, uh, caste system, huh? So at the nationals, which were held in Trenton, New Jersey, and there were transportation limitations so that the really good guys from Southern California and so on couldn't get to the tournament. But uh, I managed to score the highest score and was first in the National Prep School Championships of 1944, wow. in the spring of 44. That's all that fancy diving jackknives and swans and lips and Yes, twists. it was a three meter board, one meter board, just three feet. and. Uh, it was my major accomplishment athletic-wise. Don God, good job. Yeah. Now, uh, when did you say this is all in, in prep school as opposed to high school. So how was life, if you will, just before you went into the service? Would you leave it from prep school or did you go to college first? No, no, I was uh, still in prep school. Okay. But, uh, I had heard it was the spring of 1945, and uh, the war in Europe was getting close to being, being over. And there was a rumor that went around in our town that enlistments in the Navy were going to be curtailed. We're not going to have any more enlistments in the Navy, but the draft for the Army was going to continue because they would need people for the invasion of Japan. Mm -hmm. and and various other activities. So I decided that even though I was 17, I should enlist in the Navy, and I got my parents to sign for me. And in March, I believe it was, I enlisted and was told to go home and I would be called at some time or other. So uh, I went home and abandoned all hope of making the baseball of, uh, staying for graduation, knowing that I wouldn't be going any minute into the service. So I concentrated on making the baseball team, which I failed to do. And <laughs> finally, uh, at the end of May, I received my notice to report on June the 4th. So on It wouldn't excuse you long enough to graduate? <laughs> on June 4th, I stopped by at my school to say goodbye to whomever was happened to be there. And I went to the headmaster's office, and this was the first time I had told anybody that I had enlisted in the Navy. And I told him that uh, I was had enlisted in the Navy, and he said, congratulations, Tony, for your, for your patriotic duty. Now I'll have to get busy and make it possible for you to have your examinations test your final exams. And I said, you don't understand, I'm on my way to report right now. So I said goodbye to him. He was sort of upset that I hadn't told him beforehand that I had enlisted. And off I went on the train to Philadelphia to the office that I was told to report to.
Where was that? I'm not sure where it was in Philadelphia, but I know we took a train then down in a southerly direction uh, down to Bainbridge, Maryland. Okay. Port deposit. And we got off there. Now when, what year, us. what month, if you know? This was very early in June. In 44, 45? In 1945. Okay, thank you. And uh, the Germans had surrendered by now, and only Japan was left. Okay. So. Now, when you reported aboard, when you say into boot camp, uh, I've asked this of every guy, and everybody has a, a little different take, but there's not exactly a warm feeling. What were your first reaction when you went from prep school to Bainbridge boot camp? It was first week or so. Uh, it was it was extremely interesting to suddenly be exposed to a vast array of people, especially the fellows from down south, which uh, were had very different attitudes about uh, about things, especially black people. Uh, Bainbridge at that time was pretty much segregated. The Eighth Regiment for training was for black people. And the, I was in the second regiment, and it was uh, interesting, the shots that we would have, uh, inoculations for all sorts of diseases and ailments, the first day, of, and then haircuts. The first day <laughs> we had a haircut, uh, which uh, was very interesting the night before. Uh, another boy and I, young man and I, uh, gave ourselves Apache haircuts oh. with uh, electric razors. So we just had a stripe back. And then the next day, the ship's barber, as they called the guy at the base, the ship's barber, uh, skinned us down. We were truly skinheads yeah. by the time he finished. But it grew out. And yeah. Now, what were your reactions when you started getting clothing and so forth? Uh, did it fit? Did you feel comfortable with it? And uh, how did you change from civilian to a sailor. Yeah, it was, uh, it was very interesting. We got a whole complete set of everything uh, that you could imagine, uh, including uh, long strings of twine, which were marked where we would cut them, and they were short bits of twine about that long called a laundry stop, laundry stop I believe. Yeah. And they were used for hanging the clothes, clothes stops. on the line uh, when you wash them. Uh, the shots were very interesting uh, to go manner. through the line, to go through, to go down a line with both arms bared and the corpsman jamming you on each side. Like a ping pong. Like, like a ping pong. And uh, I remember that second set of shots that we got, a couple of friends and I cooked it up that they were, shots were given in the chow hall. And the various different companies would line up outside. And when we were coming out after our shots, we had seen a fresh company of boots. We could tell that they were boots because of their hair and their, yeah. their hats were all perfect and their uniforms had never been washed yet and so on. So we cooked it up that every third one of us as we went out would collapse and two would pick him up by the shot and drag him down from the shots. And we could see all these fresh boots where we're going in for their first shots. <laughs> Getting apprehensive, exactly, Bob. You're nasty. Yes, there's a, there's a mean streak in me. No, I don't mean you're, what's the word, adventurous, okay? <laughs> no, uh, you've probably had the same deal with KP for how long? It, was, it was a week. Uh, you had service duty for a week. And uh, fortunately, I had paid attention to the military drills and learning all those things. So I got put on the color guard. And the only thing we had to do was raise a flag in the morning and take it down in the afternoon. And we would march and uh, be given directions, left face, right face, and so on. And one thing I remember that for four or five days, every day, the drill instructor, whoever it was that was giving us our orders, about a dozen of us, we would go out and we'd stand and he'd always say, and then uh, company right face and we'd turn right and march off. And on the last day, some substitute officer came and 
when it came time for the end of the flag ceremony, he said, left face, and half of us turned to the right because we had been trained. <laughs> Pavlov <laughs> would have been proud of you. You, so, you salivated the right way. At any rate. No, uh, you said officer. That was our service, our service duty. But some of the other fellows in the company who were in, uh, in the chow hall, and they had things like emptying the slop pails mm. and digging things out. They came back from their day's duty, and I was really very grateful that I had learned to march the way they wanted me to. And doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt. As you say, you play the game, you'll wait. You play to be cute, you don't stand much of a chance. And so you said a substitute officer. Now, your DI, was he a, a Marine or a Navy type? Oh, he was a Navy uh, second, seaman second class. A second and class had, seaman? Right. And, but we had a chief petty officer in charge of the 120 people, and his boot pusher, okay. as we called him, was a seaman second class. And uh, the chief petty officer, I believe, played on the baseball team at Bainbridge, and so he was uh, so permanent he was, duty. He got a, a special duty, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. as one of the shortest guys in the company, but when we were all lined up for marching places, there were we were all at the back. When if we were six wide, the six smallest were at the back, so that the platoon or the company was went from the tallest at the front and down to the back. Well, some of my friends who were also short and wise guys, uh, they would, when we were marching off to some place where they weren't going to be taking attendance, these fellows would peel out and go to the rec hall or to the mm -hmm. PX and, uh, and, and show caught? up later. And not get caught? And uh, sometimes they would get caught, yes, and I would watch them and I'd I could tell when they were going to get caught and when they weren't going to get caught. And if they weren't going to get caught, I would go with them oh. and, and, and we wouldn't get caught. But at any rate. Now, uh, in boot, uh, did you have one of those, uh, I'll call it a abandoned ship that you had to drop from a, a, a tower? To jump into the pool. You, with your diving experience, you had no trouble with that, we, did you? As a matter of fact, that thank you for reminding me of that. I hadn't hadn't thought about it, but we did indeed have uh, swimming instruction and how to put on life jackets mm -hmm. and so on. And there was also the tower. And I did get reprimanded for doing a one and a half off the tower. Oh, I rather, knew you were going to say that. Rather than just jumping with you my know, arms folded. Don't let me way. die. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, when, when I came to the front of this 30-foot tower, I, well, why not? <laughs> and that was, I landed okay. It wasn't bad. Okay, I had, straight down. No I had straight. done some diving out of trees uh, before I went in the service. So. You, uh, you and Tarzan? What? You Tarzan? Good. <laughs> Swinging, <laughs> Swinging on the grapevine. Mike. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, when did you have a chance to select, if you will, what you wanted to study? What courses were open to you? How did you get oh, them? That was very interesting. And of course, we had aptitude tests. And then we went for an interview after all these mm -hmm. tests had been given. And uh, <clears throat> so I went into this. Uh, petty officer, and he had my records there, and he said, uh, all right, now then, uh, I see you did very well in this, that, or the other thing. Uh, uh, what Your first choice will be radio school. He and told I you. Sa he said, your first choice is radio school. What would be your second choice if you if you ha had it? And I said, well, I think I really like to be a real sailor and go to quartermaster training. And he said, okay, that, we'll put that down as your second choice. Now then, you should understand that all the schools are closed now because uh, the war by this time was over. The Hiroshima had come along in, in August. And uh, this was when I was being interviewed for jobs, future jobs. So I was just told to go home and come back and they'd find something for me to do. So they sent you home? So, they, well, they sent me home on nine-day leave okay. at the end of boot camp. And uh, I went back and got placed in the outgoing unit where I became 
uh, worked in the chow hall uh, at night, night service, and veterans were coming back to get discharged at Bainbridge, and they a train would arrive at two in the morning, and there'd be 150 would come down the chow line, and I was pretty good at cracking eggs. I learned to crack two eggs, the same one at each hand, and fry eggs for them. No shells in them, so, right? And and <coughs> cook for the for the uh, people that came down. And of course, there were sometimes there were waves that came down, and. Being a wise guy, I would always try to do the extra special job for the wave. Why? Why do you call yourself a wise guy? You just <laughs> just out to gain favor. <laughs> That's true, but uh, the chief petty officer uh, chastised me severely for being nice to those women. You can imagine what sort of word he might have had to describe well, I've, them. I've been there, and I don't think I've ever used them, but I've heard them, yeah, <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so at any rate, that's uh, what we did in the outgoing unit, and then also I went and picked apples uh, one time for us volunteered to go to a local apple orchard and pick apples while we waited to be shipped down. Oh. And that, nothing happened. Great on that. The bus delivered us, and the bus was there to take us back. Okay, so you didn't have any extra liberty. No. No, no. no short time leaves. No. Okay. When did you finally get, uh, it's the best word, uh, prepared or shipped to, for going overseas? Has that happened yet? Yeah. Uh, uh, what happened was uh, I was told to, to report to for outgoing service and didn't really know where we were going to go. We were told to uh, go down to Port Deposit and get on the train. And so we got on this special train and headed north up to, into towards Delaware. And we all got excited and saying, hot dogs, we're going to have liberty in Philadelphia tonight. We must be going to the Philadelphia Navy Yard. But then the train turned across and went east and then down the Delmarva Peninsula. And finally it arrived at Port, De not Port Deposit, I forget, Port something or other at the end of the Delmarva Peninsula. Which is and, where? I don't know the geography. Uh, well, it's Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Okay. The peninsula that comes down on well, the side of Baltimore right? Bay. Yep. So at any rate, we got off the train with our sea bags and whatnot, and there was a ferry boat, a regular U.S. type ferry like the motor ship Mount Washington, but much bigger. And uh, we boarded it and uh, kept our sea bags and gear with us and <clears throat> proceeded to go about a two or three hour trip across the bottom of that bay to the town of the city of Norfolk and went into the Norfolk Navy base and down one gangplank across the, across the dock and up another gangplank onto a ship which somebody identified as the USS Albemarle. And Which is what, a, a, a APA? It was a, uh, it was a seaplane tender that had been converted to passenger use. Oh. It had only very recently been converted. And uh, so we were told to dump our sea bags down that hole over there, and it de disappeared three or four decks down someplace. And we had our little traveling bag with us. And the, the seaplane tender had a huge hangar deck that was perhaps 30 feet high and 50 feet wide with doors that came down. And inside this deck, normally, seaplanes would be worked on and maintained or stored. And, uh, but now they had, that equipment had all been taken out, and they had put in a thing that looked like a jungle gym, four or five high, pipes all welded together. And with canvas strapped between. Well, oh, that was your stateroom. That was our stateroom. Yeah, yes, exactly. been there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> go ahead, keep going. <laughs> so, at any rate, uh, uh, we found our own, and I managed to find one that was up on an upper upper berth, and we weren't assigned any particular one. It was just find a find a yeah. sack. Okay. And uh, so and the dumb guys went so to the we bottom did that, one. And by that time, uh, some of the ship's company were coming back from uh, 
duty and they could come back and stagger up the gangplank. They'd been off in Norfolk having a good time. And uh, so finally we went to sleep actually and uh, because we were exhausted from the long day. And I remember then waking up and the ship had already left port and was steaming away. We could see Norfolk in the distance. Disappearing. Huh? And it was a beautiful day and, the, and the, the waves were just rolling slowly out behind us. And uh, I'm not, I, I noticed that there seemed to be balloons out there. And uh, uh, these balloons were drifting along in the wind and where the, what the, what's with those balloons? And then I looked across the way, I saw a balloon come out of uh, one of the bunks about four or five away from me and here was this white balloon that went drifting out along with all the others behind the ship and I called over to the guy and I said, hey, Joe, what's up? What's going on? And his reply was, we don't need no condoms where we're going. Oh. And so, <laughs> so by then we were slowly learning that we were headed for the South Pacific. And uh, it must have been oh, okay then. You, if you're on the East Coast, did you go back down through the canal? Yes. The, Tell the, us about the, that. The That's plan was weird. to go through the Panama Canal, and after about uh, maybe six or seven days, the ship made it to the the. Uh, Atlantic side of the Panama Canal, which happens to be west of the Pacific side, but uh, geographically, yeah, because of the funny angle that it went on to. But at any rate, uh, that's when the ship's company, half the ship's company, we were just passengers on the ship, but half of the guys who were manning the ship went on short leave mm -hmm. in uh, Cocosola, I guess it was, and. Uh, uh, towards the evening, they started coming back. Some of them were delivered by the shore patrol. The shore patrol would come up and they'd unload you mean a they, drunken they guys sailor were lost? and uh, drop them off, and they would stagger up the uh, the gangplank, and we were all watching on the deck as they came up. And I remember one that, uh, as he staggered up, he reached down inside his shirt and pulled out some ladies' undergarments and threw them up in the air and everybody cheered Yay. and yelled, <laughs> chill for him. And uh, he got taken away. And uh, then uh, the only thing that didn't happen was uh, a Jeep didn't come down and go off the end of the dock the way it did in some movie I saw oh. much later. But it was then we went through the Panama Canal, uh, up through three locks to uh, get the ship raised up to the level of Gatun Lake. And uh, we went across Gatun Lake and uh, it was all just scenic watching. There was very little in the way of, uh, of other boat action, if any. And then we started into uh, the, what's called the Calibra Cut. And about halfway through the Calibra cut, it was early in the evening then, all of a sudden the ship started to, the starboard side of the ship started to go up in the air. And where's the port side? The port side, port left, yes. Uh, the port side went way up in the air and there was this tremendous rushing, roaring now, vroom, 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 vroom. And what had happened was the ship had run aground and in, in, bent in one the of bay? the propellers out of oh. out of commission, and so we went the rest of the way through Calibra Cut on one prop, and then down through the locks on uh, the Pacific side, and we laid in in the harbor there for two days while the management of the ship got orders from Washington as to what to do with the ship and what to do with us. And those and, orders were. And finally, we got word that we were to go to San Francisco instead of the Philippines. And uh, so we started north uh, up the west side of Mexico in the Pacific Ocean on one, on one propeller. That must have been and, slow uh, duty, wasn't it? And it was kind of slow. And uh, there wasn't a lot to do. I had volunteered 
to help unload some uh, 40 millimeter small cannons that were at the stern of the ship for, for protection. And uh, so we got those unloaded and then just sat around, except then we got word that a, the executive officer on a destroyer had had an attack of appendicitis and it was going to be transferred to our ship for an operation because the destroyer was not oh, but stable you had medical enough. aboard then. Huh? And uh, <laughs> so we watched while they tried to rig a breacher's buoy, but the ships went in opposite directions. It was kind of rough and, and, the and the line would break or sag down. And so finally they decided that they'd bring the the executive officer across in a, in a lifeboat. So they lowered a lifeboat from the destroyer and these these sailors brought the guy across and they got raised up in a, in his, uh, you know, the thing that you carry people on the stretcher. 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 Yeah. And uh, the executive officer of the ship came back and I thought he was going to offer coffee or something to the guys on the ship, but he called down to the officer of the deck and said, Give those men a well done. And so that was Yippee. the big thing for the big <laughs> thing. And so the, the fellow on the right of manning the the gangway and whatnot down to the to the lifeboat down there on the water bouncing all around, he said, Well done, repeated the well done, and these guys tugged on their forelocks and said, Oh, thank you, sir, thank you, sir, and went back to the destroyer and we proceeded on to San Francisco and uh, where we were offloaded in, uh, uh, at Mare Island for a couple of days while they scrounged up another ship for us to come. I think it was uh, President Adams. And then we got loaded onto the President Adams. Uh, finally, we're, we were reunited with our sea bags so we could have a change of clothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we sailed on this other ship out from San Francisco and as we went out under the Golden Gate Bridge we looked back and there was a big banner up there for the returning veterans home. that said welcome home. Ah, <laughs> <Viacom Dios. laughs> and there we were headed for the Philippines. Okay. How long did, it, did you stop at uh, Pearl? No, no, we went nonstop and uh, we were 21 days from Panama to San Francisco, which isn't all that far, but it was only 10 days to the Philippines. So what you did, you had a, a paid cruise, really, then. Yeah, we were. If you were going as passengers, you didn't have to do any ship work, like chipping paint and mess cooking and all that. That's right. There was, there was nothing to do. We got two meals a day, and uh, we did have, we could walk around above deck, and I discovered a porthole that led to the officer's mess and I exchanged a dollar bill for a hot turkey sandwich which uh, one of the crewmen inside handed just out to me. happened to have one handy, huh? <laughs> I just happened to have one How'd handy. How'd you find out about that little supply <laughs> I'm line? I'm not sure how I found out about it, but uh, uh, I know I think the porthole was open and there were very attractive aromas oh, wafting yeah. out and uh, at any rate it was very nice to have, that was the one good meal that I had because as I say, there were just two meals a day for passengers. And, and going on, any guys get sick and so forth, or mal Oh, uh, the, the down below decks, uh, the fellows were, were just terribly sick. Uh, and the, the, the smell of the up chuck was uh, almost overpowering. And I found that if I went up on deck and I found a lifeboat that was on davits next to the loft hanging out over the side, and I found where I could get in underneath the canvas of this lifeboat and spend a nice quiet night there without anybody up chucking next to me or complaining or crying or whatevering. And then uh, one of the ship's company would come and wake me up 
in the morning and make sure that I got out before anybody discovered I was there. <laughs> so you went AWOL on a ship, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay, when you got to the Philippines, what happened? Where were you assigned then? Yeah, we were... What were, you, what were your duties done? Well, uh, we were offloaded and uh, <coughs> went to a, a uh, receiving unit and I got assigned on the second or third day to the 129th United States Naval Construction Battalion. Amen. And uh, so I thought that I was going to be going to sleep with the CB, sleep in the mud with uh, the CBs, but found out that it was quite the contrary. The CBs was really fantastic duty. But on the receiving unit, it was very interesting because after the first meal on land at the receiving unit, when I was going back to the Quonset hut where I was stationed, I reached in my shirt pocket because I had a partial plate that had one tooth on that had gotten knocked out a couple of years before and I had a, a partial plate with the one tooth on it. And I never got used to eating with it, so I would always, when I was having a meal, I'd put, it, it. put, it, put <laughs> it in my pocket. So as I was going back to the Quonset hut, I'd reached in and it wasn't there, panic, panic. And uh, so I tried to find out and they said, well, when you get to your unit, uh, see the dentist. So when I did get to the 129th, and the first thing I did was I found where the dental office was and went to the went to him, it was at another location when I had the chance to do it, and he informed me that only the officers got false teeth out here. You just have to do without it. So, <laughs> so they couldn't so, chew you out, huh? So in the next year, the teeth grew, grew together and there wasn't really that much room. Okay. But now it was, the 129th was a very unique organization. They were responsible for water maintenance for a base which had 50,000 50,000 population for at its height. Now, which of the islands were you on? Which? Which of the islands in the Philippines oh, was it's on? Oh, Samar. It was on okay. the southern tip of Samar. Oh, yeah. And uh, Calicoan was, uh, it was an extension of Samar. And uh, as I say, there were 50,000 at one time. They are getting ready for the invasion of Japan. And uh, the, the Japanese who had had occupied it before uh, before the Battle of Subic Bay, they had managed to have enough water for a troop of 500 or so was their manning. And uh, when the CVs got there, the, uh, first of all, the Filipinos had taken care of all the Japanese soldiers, I understand, and they had been eliminated from the face of the earth within a few hours after the Battle of Subic Bay. And uh, so the CBs found, and with the aid of the Filipinos, found caves that were filled with water and so on. And so there was water pipes were a foot and a half in diameter, carrying water all over were the place. Were they springs, spring fed? And spring fed and pumped from, uh, from caves that uh, were Oh, oh, underground caves, or caverns. Underground caves that okay. were, that were so What were your with duties water. there then? What were, you, what were you assigned I, to do? I was assigned to electrical maintenance for the water maintenance people. And what happened was a life bulb would blow out in a, in a distant pump station, then you'd have to go out and replace the light bulb, or fuses blow, you'd have to do that. Uh, we did wiring for some of the new places that, uh, we had to do, and the, the fellows that I worked with uh, trained me. They called me Junior, and uh, <laughs> they said that when, when you're trained, we can go home. So they worked very hard at training made, me. Made damn sure you got smart They quick. also did exciting things like a magneto generator. They would, were used to being electrocuted themselves, and they could hold two wires like this and say, crank, Junior, and I'd crank and they'd open their fingers up and the bell would stop and then they'd squeeze it and the bell would ring with the electricity going through them. Then they'd say, here, you try. So I'd hold it like that and they'd turn the crank about a quarter of a turn and I'd yep. be through, through the ceiling. One time they were gonna teach me how to climb to to pole work mm -hmm. and so on. So they said had, they had a light bulb that had to be changed out that uh, 
in, in, in the campground. And uh, so what they had done is they had taken the hot wire and nailed it into the tree. And so when I went to put on the irons, I had short pants on irons, and went up to the, to the coconut palm the, where the lamp was, I reached up and put my foot into it, and the electricity went up one leg and down the other. I just short-circuited out. They thought it was a big joke. And did you but, fall <laughs> off or did you go off? I fell. I, fell I, I, I was. I hung there for a little bit, and then finally I fell backwards, and my foot came out, and the oh, no juice stopped. No safety belts. <laughs> well, that's after you get up there. You okay. Don't, but sometimes they. I think the utility companies tell the guys that they have to put say, put the belt around and then climb up. But that's a, that's a nuisance. You have to climb on to hold on to the the tree or the. Thing, but at any rate. Oh, but it it's also saves your bacon in case you do get stuck <laughs> like that. Or, or you just slide down because your hooks come, it came out and now that's holding you close to, the, close to the palm tree or the pole, whatever it is, and you slide down held tight against it. Yeah, you get scratched I think I'd rather the pull away oh, yeah. than have all those. Oh, one time I climbed a 90-foot pole uh, to save on installing other poles. And as I climbed up, I had, a, a, by that time, I had a Filipino help me, helper in this line gang, and he would tie on another 30-foot piece of rope of a, my hand line. At any rate, uh, so I had, had three hand lines to the top of that pole. But you made it. It was the highest that I had ever gone. gone. Well, now, how long did you stay there before they sent you home? Uh, I was there from November until June, and then uh, of what? Forty-six. Uh, November of forty-five to June of forty-six. Okay. And uh, came home and got assigned to the USS Albemarle, which was a cruiser, not Albemarle. I'm sorry, the Birmingham. That was the, and the, the Birmingham, which is a city name, so it's yep. a cruiser. Cruiser. And uh, it was being decommissioned at Mare Island. And so I was there for about three or four weeks, I guess, uh, waiting till I had enough points for discharge. I think I, by then I had maybe 12 or 13 points. You got one point for each month of service and a half a point extra for overseas or something. But I didn't have that many. <laughs> well, you and if Deacon, you were the mothball team then. <laughs> That's that, right. We were mothballing. Explain that, because a lot of people hear the term but don't really understand what what well, has to go into well, it. Well, mothballing, uh, as you go around uh, to our marinas in uh, in. New Hampshire at, uh, in the fall and winter and early spring, you'll see ships with, not ships, but boats, boats with canvas, kinds, yeah. and it can be stretched tight over top of them, uh, shrink-wrapped in effect to uh, protect them over the winter. And they were shrink-wrapping the, the ships. They would put, put this plastic, or I'm not sure about plastic in those days, but they would stretch canvas down over the guns to keep the rain and water out. And Before that, though, I'll interrupt you. Don't you have to clean the damn things out and preserve them? Well, get the well rust that, off was, and that was done beforehand. Oh, you, you yeah. didn't? Oh, okay, you're just a uh, stretcher then. Right, well, they've they done that. But there were places we, we did, actually, my duties consisted primarily of chipping paint and then putting more paint yeah. down to take the place the of the wound. paint and then go on liberty and uh, come back and do the same thing the next day, sometimes below decks, sometimes above, above decks. And in fact, I, at that point, I was thinking about re-enlisting in the Navy, and I went to uh, one of the officers and told him that I was thinking about re-enlisting re because I was in what they called the V6, victory in six months, but it had been victory in 12 months before I got discharged. But uh, I thought about enlisting for a three-year three -year hitch. And uh, he said to me, well, what will you do if you don't? And I said, well, I go, go home, I guess. Uh, I've been accepted at college, and I guess I'll go home and go to college. And he put his hand on my shoulder and said, son, go. you don't want to re-enlist. Go home and go to college. Amen. And did you? And so I did. I went home. I hadn't told anybody that uh, anybody at the school where I'd been accepted. Uh, so, but I knew I got out at the end of August, 
And uh, so I went back to the prep school where I had been before, and they hadn't given me a diploma, even though I was uh, at the bottom of the class when I stopped studying to try to make the baseball team. So I was only 19 then and still eligible for sports. So they accepted me back on the GI Bill of Rights. In the prep school. And so I used uh, nine or 10 months of GI Bill of Rights at uh, my old prep school and uh, had a good time. There were four other vets also. We had our own vets basketball team, which didn't win in the intramural, but we had, had fun a playing a good together. Time <laughs> okay. Now, when did you, oh, excuse me, what school did you then transfer to to finish and get your four years? Did you get a four-year college? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, I went to, uh, to Princeton, as it happened, to, and um, after two-thirds of the way through my my sophomore year, I cashed my last GI Bill of Rights check. I think it was up to $70 a month, and we got living allowance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to the dean of men and told him I was going to resign from the school because I'd supported myself since I was before I was 18 years old, and I wasn't going to have my parents pay my way anymore. And, you can imagine it was sort of dumb. But uh, he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to get a job. And then when I find out how difficult it is without a college education, uh, I'm going to want to come back and really pay attention to my studies. And uh, he said, well, if you get out in the world and find it's tough to uh, get along, that's one thing. But if you find that you get promoted and have a better job and the, the employer really likes you and so on, then we'll be glad to take you back. So that was sort of a if and reverse on it. But at any rate, I went home and told my parents that I had resigned. And my mother said, what are you going to do? And I said, get a job. And she said, well, if you don't get a job on Monday, will you promise to go back? To school to college and I said okay so on Monday I went in I went first off to the Philadelphia Electric Company because I had trained as a lineman and whatnot mm -hmm. and they told me that they weren't really hiring now and thanks a lot for your interest so I knew the telephone company also had polls so I went down the street to the telephone office and went in and said I wanted to eat and the fellow said well you could take some tests so we'll have data about you so I said okay so I took the test and he said you go to go to lunch and come back and uh, so I went to lunch and came back and the Mr. Todd it was said uh, well I see these tests I don't understand why you flunked out of Princeton because you did very well and uh, I said, well, I said I didn't flunk out, I resigned. He, he said, yes, that's what they all say. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> So at any rate, he offered me a job in which he was going to send me to school for a year, at 33, starting at $33 a week, to learn about a new type of dial equipment that the telephone company was going to install. So I went home, told my mother I thought I had a job, and she said, oh, what doing? Who would hire you? And I said, the telephone company, what do they want you to do? Well, they want to send me to school for a year. They, if it's a school, you just quit school. I said, yes, but they're going to send, pay me $33 a week. And she said, they will? So at any rate, oh. so the, I had to take a physical for them. That, uh, then I started with the telephone company and was there until 1981. From Oh, you made a long time out of it, huh? Yeah. Good deal. Great. Now, you've gone through and had all kinds of good stuff. Uh, silly question, but do you feel that your service experience was a positive or negative impact on your life? I think definitely that my time in the service had a very positive, positive the people that I got to know and respect from, uh, from other walks of life and so on. Uh, some of the things uh, that you hear about the service uh, get exaggerated, but I found the service was 
was okay. I didn't run into any really bad guys or troublemakers or okay. anything. Now, in your long span in the phone company, what was your life like there? As far as who you promoted, did you ever get to climb another pole by yourself and that kind of only, stuff? What was your life like only, there? Only in a student engineering program did I get to climb a pole. Uh, I was sent to the school to learn about this new type of dial equipment for a year, and it took a year to to, really get do, it down to, cold, yeah. to study how number five crossbar worked, and also something called uh, uh, automatic message accounting, which was an antiquated, now by today's standard, way of taking calls. And then I started as a switchman, uh, keeping the central offices working for the early dial mm -hmm. systems. And uh, after five years, then I was promoted into management and went to the engineering department. And that's where I spent the rest of okay. my telephone career. Oh, and a couple of promotions. And, uh, but I think I might have gotten a few more promotions, but my wise guy nature Sometimes, deadly some enemy. Meeting, yes, uh, okay. uh, some vice president would be giving a talk to a whole group of us, and the, and the question and answer period would come, and I'd say, uh, Vice President Jones, uh, early in your talk you said such and so, and then in your wrap up you said such and such. Now, how do you rationalize those two apparent contradictions? And I'd see him turn to us and say, what's that guy's yeah. name? Fire this. <laughs> okay. But at any rate, it was, it, it was, as I say, I retired in 1981, and that was before the breakup of the Bell system, and uh, they've been very good, very good to me. Good. Two words. Thank you, buddy. Okay, thank it's you for good. having me. And thank you for sharing it with us. All right. All right. I hope I haven't bored anybody. I don't too think much. so. I, there's a lot of questions <laughs> I'll ask you when we get a lot, to. A lot was, a lot was left out. So. I know. <laughs> I didn't tell you before, though. When I left uh, Camp Perry, I was assigned to the 129th ah. Davisville way back then. Uh -huh. They transferred me out to some other outfits. Yeah. So we're, we're brothers a long way apart, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Folks, I guess that's a wrap up for now. Uh, like all the other stories, this is one fellow who did his thing. Everybody wasn't Audie Murphy. That's not the important thing. The big fact is if you had a job to do and you did it, all I can say is please, if you're so in time, come and see us and we'll have some fun putting your show together too. As a reminder, remember that number, 211. If you need help or you know some veteran you feel might need help. That's going to be the lifeline for a lot of guys I know. It's there. All you have to do is ask. Bob Stevens saying again, we hope you've enjoyed this show. If it's given us some interest, even better. And if it turns you on, come and see us. Please, stay healthy. Goodbye.